Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams. Daniel, good to see you. Good to see you, Dr. Paul. Oh, very good. Um, we do have a special guest today. I'm going to introduce him in a minute, but uh, we have a bit of an announcement about our program. Yes, the, the Ron Paul Liberty Report uh, YouTube channel has now surpassed 90,000 subscribers. So we're very happy about that. Wonderful. I guess we're aiming for 100. That's a nice round figure. And we want to thank all of our viewers, that's for sure. And please uh, send the show around, get your friend to su friends to subscribe, share the show, uh, and keep watching. Well, very good. And uh, our guest today uh, is involved in politics, somebody I met during my campaigning up in the state of Maine. And he is now running for the Senate in Maine. His name is Eric Brakey. And uh, he's going to be running for the U.S. Senate. Mm. And this is great. Eric, uh, welcome to our program today. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, great. You know, you've had a pretty interesting career. Um, you know, I asked you earlier, you know, exactly when you got started. And uh, some people got started, you know, way back. And some people got started in the OA campaign. But you actually got interested as recently as 2012. And you were so energized. You got involved in our campaign, led the state for our campaign. And ended up running for state senate and winning two senate races there where did you get all this energy <laughs> well i'll say first first of all i i really uh i wish i had been smart enough in 2008 to realize uh realize the the value of the liberty message and what you were doing at the time unfortunately it took a it took a few years of of my my older brother and and some folks around me uh knocking the message into my head before i finally got it and i and I finally put those folks like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity <laughs> to the side and realized that uh, what Fox News told me it meant to be a Republican was not actually, you know, what it meant to be someone who believed in limited government and the Constitution. So it wasn't until 2010 and 2011 that I really feel like I got, you know, pulled out of the matrix a little bit and, and uh, began to appreciate uh, the liberty message. And I, I dived right in uh, at the time. I, I, uh, in 2011, I was fresh out of college. I was living in New York City, and I got involved with uh, a grassroots Ron Paul uh, uh, group there, which ended up leading to a job opportunity with the campaign. I came back to Maine to work on the campaign there, where my family goes back for eight generations. And I, I never looked back. I kept, uh, when I realized after with the success we had, organizing in Maine, uh, connecting with people who believed in liberty, and the impact we were able to have, as you may remember, Dr. Paul, we, we won the, the convention there. We won all the delegates. Uh, the RNC had something else to say about it, and they <laughs> kind of illegally violated their own rules and kicked a bunch of us out. But, uh, but it really showed me what a few well-organized people really working towards liberty can accomplish if you are dedicated and organized. And I've just been doing it ever since ever since you retired from Congress and kind of handed the liberty torch on to all of us. Well, I've just been trying to run with it as best as I can. Yeah, you've done exceptionally well, and I'm always fascinated with individuals that seem to have like a, a light switch turn on and it all comes together and you get excited. I think it happens to all of us that the, that the whole idea of liberty uh, comes together and then we put it together and we talk about foreign policy and civil liberties and economic liberty. But do you recall in that transition that you had, was there one thing that really turned the switch on or one thing that was more difficult to say, well, I'm for liberty, but I don't know if I want to let people do A, B, C. Did you have any of that, or did you just sort of uh, transition in rather smoothly? Well, I'll say the hardest thing and the last thing I kind of held on to was kind of the neoconservative foreign policy ideas. Mm -hmm. I really, when I was in, in high school, I was very political. I watched Fox News all the time. I, I, I really believed it hook, line, and sinker. When John McCain was our nominee in 2008, I'm a little ashamed to say that I was genuinely excited for him, and boy, was I wrong about about that. But um, but it was the foreign policy that was very difficult for me, and and to really acknowledge uh, my own places where I had been wrong in the past, and and what those ideas had led to, the mess in in Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. what that what that had led to. That can be hard to admit to yourself. Right. Uh, I remember the the big kind of. 
I remember the light switch moment, though. I was actually in 2010, I was uh, watching a lot of Glenn Beck. And I remember there was a day on his program. He had, um, he had a whole week devoted to let's look at different ways we can cut spending in different programs and let's put all the sacred cows on the table. And I remember one day he brought up uh, military spending and say, you know, this is our real, our big sacred cow, but we need to be able to look at this and acknowledge that there is waste in the military budget. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gave me as a young uh, person kind of a little permission to let these ideas uh, hit me in a way that I hadn't been willing to accept mm -hmm. before. And it kind of kept going from there. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, Eric, you know, you mentioned Hannity and O'Reilly and all the so-called uh, Republicans and conservatives. It's funny, you, you mentioned they're for limited government, this sort of thing, a uh, government that doesn't do much at home. But, you know, their foreign policy is the opposite of limited government. They want massive right. welfare, massive warfare overseas. Uh, you know, they b we're supposed to believe the government that can't run uh, the DMV here can run the West, rest of the world. So I know it, it can be difficult to take that leap, but there's the, the point that we just can't do it. But I was going to give you a little test here, if you don't mind, <laughs> to put you in the hot seat. Um, uh, you know, if you, because frankly, if, you, if, if, if you're successful, and we certainly hope you are, you will have significant power when it comes to foreign policy. And we've seen the lonely stands that have been taken by Rand Paul and Mike Lee and others, and they can't actually really have the power to draw people's attention to something. So I'm wondering what your response might have been uh, to President Trump's decision just a few days ago to send about 60 Tomahawk missiles into Syria uh, without making his case to Congress, of course, uh, and without making a case to the American people, in fact, without providing any evidence. What would you have done had you been sitting in the Senate at the time? Well, I've been very outspoken about that since it happened, uh, and I was very disappointed. You know, Donald Trump campaigned on uh, an America first foreign policy. He contrasted himself to Hillary Clinton talking about how we needed to stay out of Syria and how it would be a big mess and a big mistake if we got in there. Um, in 2013, when President Obama wanted to go into Syria, I was very outspoken. I kind of led an effort in Maine to encourage our congressional delegation to vote against going into Syria to stay out of it. And I'm, and if, if we are ever to commit to war, that, that the Constitution requires that Congress needs to decide that, not the president. Uh, and I'm just as committed to that idea and those principles now with a de with a Republican president as I was in the past with a Democrat president. Sometimes I get a little discouraged. It seems like whichever party is out of power suddenly becomes the party of the Constitution. And, and then the moment they get in power, they seem to forget about it all again. And that's discouraging. I, I, I really, I'm for the Constitution any day of the week, no matter who's in power. And I would hope that we would all be so principled. Uh, Eric, uh, I want to bring up an economic issue, and uh, I suspect you are probably with us on this, but I want to find out how uh, interesting it might be to your constituents and whether you talk much about it. And that has to do with the money issue. And, you know, the markets aren't uh, exactly steady, and there's lots of anticipation that we have a lot of debt problems and things to happen. But, you know, the Federal Reserve has always been a big issue with me, and it uh, is instrumental in uh, uh, providing the temporary funds for welfare and warfare. So is that an issue that you've talked about and do you think it's something that the people of Maine care about and uh, do you think it uh, might get you some votes uh, by discussing monetary policy and deficit financing through the, you know, the central bank? Well, absolutely. I think what it comes down to, when I talk to people about it, I think people are frustrated in both parties about what they see as corporate welfare. And I think that this is kind of one of the ultimate forms of corporate welfare. This is a, essentially a corporate welfare program for, for the big banks to let them control the, the price of money and the supply of money. And, you know, it, interestingly enough, the person I'm running against, Senator Angus King, uh, is the only member of the main congressional delegation to oppose audit the Fed. Every other member of the main delegation, Republican or Democrat, has been on record supporting it and voting for it. But Angus King, my opponent, has, uh, doesn't think the American people should get that level of transparency there. And that's very disappointing to me. You know, Eric, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how the Russians hacked our elections. Um, uh, we don't know about that. We haven't seen any proof. We do know that the Republican Party hacked Ron Paul's election uh, in Maine <laughs> in specifically. Uh, we have yeah. the evidence of that. And you've seen the worst. You've seen the sausage being made 
uh, when they ripped off Ron Paul. I got to ask you, what makes you want to wade into these waters? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I always tell myself if, if Ron Paul was able to do it for 30 years, then I can put myself into it for however long uh, I'm able to make a difference. I, I always think of, about, you know, uh, Dr. Paul, how lonely it must have been in Congress for all those years. I can't imagine you could have seen the, the liberty movement that would have happened in 2008 and 2012, and yet you persisted. And that really, uh, anytime I get discouraged, anytime I am... Uh, in the state Senate casting a lone no vote on a corporate welfare bill or or some uh, well-intended item of legislation that just restricts our liberties and takes our freedoms away. Uh, I just think to that, even if the, the people here in Augusta and the state capitol here, here in Maine don't get it, uh, the people at home get it. And I think that the people at home really understood at the end of the day and were inspired by, by what you, Congressman Paul, did, did in Washington. And so if you can do it for 30 years, I can, I can do it for as long as I have the patience for it. I want to uh, ask you a little bit about civil liberties because that's a main uh, plank in a libertarian platform is that uh, protecting true civil liberties is very, very important. Yeah. And uh, there's been an attack on, on civil liberties, which has been disastrous in the last 15 years as a consequence of 9-11 uh, and a misdirection, a misunderstanding. And then we ended up with the Patriot Act and the FISA courts and all these. But uh, also that's in combination with the drug war, which is an attack on civil liberties and does nothing uh, to bring about good results. And along with that, you might just mention, I was fascinated with the law that you got put in in place, uh, I believe, in, in Maine, to allow people to use new drugs and rather than waiting for the FDA to say, well, you can take a risk, even if you have a disease or a cancer that you are likely to die from soon, instead, and you wouldn't have to wait until the FDA gets approval. As long as you're up front on this, why can't people do this? So just touch on uh, the fact that civil liberties is a key part of the freedom message. A absolutely. You know, I've had a, uh, I've sponsored a lot of different legislation around protecting our rights and freedoms and our civil liberties, and some of them have been uh, very successful. Some of them have passed into law, like uh, I sponsored and passed our constitutional carry law in the state, the right to try law that you, you mentioned, allowing terminally ill patients the right to try to save their own lives and not have to get a government permission slip to try something that the FDA hasn't approved of yet. Um, but I've also uh, fought for and sponsored legislation that uh, hasn't necessarily seen the light of the, uh, hasn't become law yet. And, 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 uh, uh, but the fights were worth fighting. I sponsored the Fourth Amendment Protection Act in my first term, which would have prohibited the state of Maine from uh, cooperating with the federal government when they are doing searches without a warrant as required by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and I've, uh, I've sponsored legislation this go around trying to protect people from civil asset forfeiture and improve the, um, uh, the, the due process protections that exist there. But ultimately, uh, it's, it, it can be frustrating. I think sometimes in, in government, people, people don't get it. They don't understand the value of the freedoms that we were promised in our Constitution, and that's something we have to fight for. Uh, that's wonderful, and we're, we're going to need to go shortly, but I want to give you a chance to uh, invite our viewers to help you out, where they can go to help you, because I know what it's like campaigning, and uh, you do need supporters, and you were a worker and came in and joined our campaign. You need, you need the volunteers, you need to raise money, and if people listening to this audience think you're a good candidate, which I sincerely believe, or you wouldn't be on this show, and you've worked with me, and I believe you're going into it uh, with your eyes wide open, and you know what you're getting into, but you're going into it for the right reason. Just to run for office, to be in office, I think is terrible. But to get in office, to send a message and stick to a message, I think is very, very important. So where should our viewers go to find a place to help you out? Well, folks can go to www.ericbrakey.com and you can see our announcement campaign video. And while you're there, if you wanted to chip in uh, $50 or $25 to help get this uh, campaign, this uh, campaign for liberty for the little guy off the ground and going, it's certainly much appreciated. And I'm really happy to be on here today with you, Dr. Paul. 
Well, that's wonderful, Eric, and I want to thank you very much for being on because I know uh, our viewers will be very interested in what you're doing, and they'll be watching to see what comes of this, and I think it's uh, really great that you've, you've had the experience, and you've won a Senate, you've been elected twice in the Senate, the uh, Senate for Maine. So I think uh, with a state like Maine and size and libertarian leanings, and we've had a lot of success up there, I think you're going to do well. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And I want to thank our viewers for being with us today. And please come back soon to the Liberty Report.